continuing our conversation about adolescence, we're going to explore chapter nine, which is going to be talking more about the social emotional life of adolescence. The thing that the chapter starts with that we really want to sort of explore is Erickson's stage of development at this time. He basically says that they're in this battle between figuring out who they are, their identity achievement, versus being confused, identity confusion. And that this is a key factor in what drives adolescents at this time. It is the thing that helps adolescents begin to move away from being children, you might want to say, to being individual people. Um, they need to figure out who they are versus who they've told that they are. Everything from, do I really like this shampoo or do I like this shampoo because mom and dad bought me this shampoo, to world political views. They begin this true and deep exploration of they, who they are. Now, at times it may not seem like they're very deep, but they'll have these thoughts um, about who I am, who I'm not, and really find that they need to do this exploration at this time. So some leeway should be given to them to allow to explore, to see if this is me, see if this is me. But at the same point, parents still have to be involved because if we're not, then they're going to basically flounder, you might want to say. As we talked about in the last chapter, we have to worry about peers too, who might drive them to perhaps a a line of behavior patterns that won't be acceptable to them. But at some point, they might want to test that edge too. In your book, you'll see this table. Now, this is Marcia's four identity statuses. Make sure you understand these are statuses, not stages. So it's a status, not a stage. What Marcia comes along and says, you know, I think Eric says, right, their teens are spending all their time trying to figure out who they are right now. But what Messiah found out was that if I was to go over to, let's say, oh, Galley High School and take a snapshot of everybody in 11th grade right then, and you were to analyze them, that they were going to fall probably into one of these four categories. So the first category is diffusion here. Now, what we mean by diffusion is that this is an individual who basically hasn't really started into understanding who they are. The task of doing that is so overwhelming, they basically can't even go forward. Um, you might jokingly say they wind up in their mother's basements. But what we're talking about is a pressure that society puts on people, especially 11th graders, to begin to make these decisions for the rest of their lives. And a lot of 11th graders are overwhelmed by this. Meaning is that by 11th grade, you hear people saying, well, what school are you going to apply to? Uh, have you taken the SATs? What are you going to do in your life? What career field are you going to follow? And these individuals may say, I, I have no idea. Um, I haven't made that decision yet. I'm still young. There's so much I haven't done. And basically they hide. They can hide in many ways. You know, they talk about this playing uh, video games all this time, but they'll find an activity that they can hide in because they're not ready to move forward yet. The best you can do with these individuals is to give them some time. Everyone maturates at a different rate. And one of the wonderful things that universities and colleges have are what they call gap years, meaning this is that when you finish high school, you can take a year off before you actually start your entrance into college. And for many people, this year to spend doing something besides playing video games, um, isn't often a time to allow them to explore and to grow up. We know that most young people who enter college will change their majors. I think it's an average of 10 times in the first two years because they haven't really gotten a chance to explore. So a lot of these young people may go off and join the Peace Corps for the year, or they go off and they just simply work in the world for a year, or they take these opportunities to do other things that may come forward for them and explore different aspects of themselves. So being just a little bit older, having now the ability to understand who they are a little bit better, allows them to get out of that diffusion and perhaps kind of move forward in their lives. Now, the next group that we talk about is the foreclosure group. Now, with foreclosure, what's happened is, is that the teen has a sense of identity. But what you begin to realize is that this sense of identity really came from somebody else. So what could happen is, is you have an athlete who's really good at being 
a baseball player. And so everybody assumes that this person is going to be a baseball player. They constantly talk about them being a baseball player. And the coach says, you're going to be a baseball player. And the parents are like, yes, we've spent all this money for you to be a baseball player. And so the only thing they can think to do is be a baseball player. Um, quite often, these people get to be a little bit older and maybe get out of their parents' house or get out of school. And they hit about 25, 28 maybe even 30, and they go, why in the world am I in this field? I never liked this field. I'm only in this field because everyone told me to be in this field. I really hate this field. Parents have to be really careful about sort of society pushing people into an identity. So I will use my kid as an example. Because as I've said before, my child has a talent for violin. He's you know, better than the average bear, but he's not a prodigy. But because he's better than the average bear and because he had some opportunities young to show sort of his talent, every time he does something, people assume he's going to be a professional violinist. So when he first went to junior high, um, the first thing the person said is, oh, you're going to be a violinist, so let's get you in these music classes. And he kind of looked at me and I said, I don't think he wants to be a violinist. They said, well, we're going to put him in these music classes because he's got the talent. And he went, yeah, yeah, that's okay, that's okay. But by the time he was in the middle of middle school, he looked at me and he said, I don't want to be a professional violinist. And I said, that's perfectly okay, you don't have to be. But every time he did something because he could play violin and he enjoyed it, but he enjoyed it more as a hobby, people assumed that. So as soon as we got to high school and we went to see the guidance counselor, she'd already enrolled him in all kinds of things for art, art students. And I looked at her and said, but he doesn't want to be an art student. He wants to be a historian. He loves history, so we want to get some extra history classes. And it was like, well, don't you want this class and this class? We're like, no, he wants to be a history major. And, of course, when he got into the orchestras, the orchestra manager said, well, we can help you, you know, get into all kinds of good uh, music schools when you get out of um, here in high school. And, you know, I had to talk to him and say, well, he may be good, but that's not what he wants to do. He wants to be a historian. He loves museums. But you could see how he could easily fall into, well, I'll be a violinist because everyone says I should be a violinist and I seem to have some talent at being a violinist. So I guess that's what I am. Parents have to be careful that people don't push these expectations on these children. But at the same point, if he did want to be a violinist, then you have to be there to help them move forward. So you've got to kind of distinguish between what they feel they have to do versus what they want to do. Now, if I was to go over to the high school and look at kids, where most of the kids are going to be is in moratorium. Now, moratorium is a natural stage for all teens. And basically, it's kind of a fun stage in a way. They keep trying on things. So one week, they're a skater dude. And a month later, they're saying, I'm going to be ROTC. And two months later, they're going to be an artist. And three months later, I'm thinking about being an engineer. Oh, now I'm going to try being a surfer. Um, what this means is that basically they're trying on different personalities, they're trying on different aspects of what is adult life, you might say, and they're trying to decide which parts actually are them and which parts are not them. And from that, they're going to take all that and eventually create the personality they are. So it's perfectly fine to see teens trying on a whole bunch of different personalities and activities and personas. Now, there are some teens who are in achievement. They know who they are. You know who they are. They were this way before. They're going to be this way after. They have basically explored the alternatives, and they've chosen who they're going to be. This is not as common as you think, but there are quite a few people who do it. But I will also say that as kids get a little older, maybe when they get into 11th or 12th grade, you may find quite a few of them clicking into that achievement. But remember, we talked about adolescence going on into the 20s. So quite often early college, if they come out at 18 and they go into college and they've had that chance to explore a few things, you might find them sort of click into what they want to do then or click into sort of what group they fall into. That first couple of years alone gives them that opportunity to really feel it out. That's why sometimes that gap year in college can be really um, beneficial for many adolescents. In the very beginning of the book, there are four absolute kind of fun things, characteristics of adolescent thinking that we want to explore and know a little bit more about. 
Now, if you remember, when we talked about Piget and we talked about the pre-operational people, we talked about egocentrism. But now what we have is adolescent egocentrism. And ag adolescent egocentrism basically says that, again, they are focused on themselves and who they are and their own thoughts and their own feelings. This is, remember, we said a time when they have to begin to explore and separate from what they think they've been told that they are and who they really think that they are. But this ego centritism that they have at this time is a short period of time. You'll get through it. Um, but what happens, what's kind of fun, is some of the things that come out from that. And so one of the things that comes out from this ego centritism time is the imaginary audience. Now, the imaginary audience basically says, hey, I know everyone's watching me and they're always talking about me and the world is focused on me. And they have that feeling because, remember, they're in egocentrism. Um, you may remember this. Maybe at high school at some point you were walking down the hallway and you saw two people talking at the lockers and you just knew. You just knew they were talking about you. There was no ifs, ands, or buts. Now, as an adult, you kind of go, they probably didn't even notice I was there. But you were absolutely sure at that point. The other thing that tends to happen right here is personal fables. Now, I was a big personal fable person. I can remember being a big personal fable person. And basically, you think that you are so unique that nobody else can understand what you're going through. And I can remember sitting there and saying to my mother, you just don't understand, Mom. It wasn't that way when you were young. And of course, it was that way when she was young. But we think in adolescence that we are so unique or our, our experience is so unique that nobody else can really understand this. Now, the one that becomes kind of dangerous, to be honest, is this illusion of invulnerability. Um, I joked before about how the World Health Organization once said that being young and being male was dangerous to one's life because of the amount of risks that young men take. But this is not just young men. It's also young women who feel like something can't happen to them. Um, it is quite often uh, why young girls get pregnant when you talk to them. They're like, well, I didn't think it would happen to me. Well, I heard about that. Or a young man who does some skateboarding and, oh, that's not going to happen to me. This tends to disappear somewhere in your mid-20s. Um, my nephew often talks to me about how he knew he was grown up because one day he got a skateboard out and he said, you know what, I, I think it's kind of silly to be skateboarding some of the stuff that I did. And he hasn't really skateboarded again. He often talks about how he took these risks when he was younger and he wouldn't wear helmets or pads or knee things. He said, and now I think about it and I go, oh, my God, how did I survive any of that? Because at that point, he had this thought that he was invulnerable. This also tends to lead to very dangerous behavior by young people. So while we may tell them not to text and drive or to drink and drive, they quite often feel like that's for somebody else, that they'll be safe doing it, that it won't... Um, happen to them. It's somebody else that this does to. This illusion of invulnerability, though, can be broken if somebody they know experiences the uh, consequences of that behavior. So unfortunately, we had a young man in town who was not real drunk. He was a little buzzed, maybe had a couple of drinks, my understanding is. And when he drove home, he flipped his car and died. He was an individual that everyone kind of knew. Um, it was popular in his own way. Everybody knew who he was. And so it was a unique thing for me to see because both of my nephews knew of this young man. They had seen him in school. They knew who he was. And his funeral was packed, absolutely packed. They wanted to go. And I said, okay, let's go. And I asked, you know, how close were you to them? They said, well, not really. You know, I had him in a class here. I had him in a class there. And as we talked, what it happened is that they never saw him as a drinker and driver. They never saw him as a partier. And yet this young man died in a car accident on his way home. And they talk about how while they weren't at the party he was at, they had mutual friends at the party. And everybody had said, you know, he seemed perfectly fine. He had a couple of beers, a couple of drinks. And so this illusion of being able to have a few and leave was broken. And they become much more sensitive about drinking and driving. Um, one of them will just basically not drive, even if they've had a, a two beers, and keeps an Uber car. And the other one just simply won't drive if he's driving. 
if, if, won't drink if he's driving at all won't even have a glass of wine at dinner but the illusion was broken when that person that they personally knew died but it did not break when they were told about this thing school when they saw videos about it when they saw tv shows about it none of that really broke the illusion it wasn't until they had a personal experience with that which they today still talk about and actually even talk to my son about it and look at me and go he just doesn't get it and i have to explain to him probably not just yet the best we could do is just kind of watch over him and keep him safe The other interesting thing that happens about this time, because teens are trying to figure out who they are, is they do begin to explore quite often their ethnic identity. Now, most young people understand that they have an ethnic identity, but they may not really explore what that is or how it works or um, how to incorporate that into their own identity until they get to be more in their high school ages. And as you see there, there are kind of three phases to achieving this identity. This is why you might see uh, adolescents all of a sudden become much more interested in learning about their grandparents. Uh, sometimes you see young women who will wear traditional dresses to proms um, because they're beginning to identify with that ethnicity. But the other thing that's interesting is that when you are exploring that ethnicity in high school we also tend to find that people will begin to seek out people of the same ethnicity as you now whether or not this is because you're exploring it or because we tend to divide up into ethnic groups sort of automatically is is a question that social psychologists ask all the time the interesting thing is is that the next generation who's young they call them the z generation um, not the millennials, the ones after the millennials, actually may have a little less ethnic exploration than other groups. They do not seem to divide up into ethnicity as much as any other group. In part, they're the most, uh, I don't know how they want to put it, uh, multiracial groups that's ever been. Meaning is that almost all individuals can identify as having different ethnic backgrounds. Multiracial individuals are becoming extremely common so then if you go to a tiger woods who has four or five different ethnicities in him um, he was kind of interesting to hear because he would never really call himself african-american now other people would but he would say i can't call myself african-american when that would be basically ignoring my entire mother's side which is asian and in fact as far as african is concerned i'm only a fourth to an eighth depending on how you want to look at that because of my father who was not pure african either so he wouldn't accept himself calling himself african-american um, he didn't correct other people in fact when he was younger he created a special name for himself by combining multiple different ethnicities with him and so a lot of young people are saying the same thing which is that their identity is more than just a single identity um, they have multiple identities within themselves and even Caucasian children are beginning to look at themselves and saying but I'm Irish and I'm German and I'm English and so they're seeing that those are separate cultural backgrounds and beginning to identify themselves that way so this next generation is going to be really interesting to watch them because they're not falling into basically uh, what one young person said is there are more than just three ethnicities out there unfortunately as we have teens or as as we have young children first moving into adolescence or first coming into that time frame they tend to decrease in their self-esteem if we think about it i was the big kid on campus in sixth grade then i hit middle school and i'm the little kid on campus and so i have to figure out you know where i fit in especially for boys because they may have been the big boy on campus back when they were in sixth grade. And remember, boys are all about status. And now we get to middle school, and those ninth graders are a heck of a lot bigger than me. And then I get to high school, and those 12th graders are a heck of a lot bigger than me. So I may kind of lose some of my status. Also, we're with a lot more kids. So where I may have been the best kid on campus as far as speed is concerned when I was in sixth grade, now I get to middle school and I'm maybe the third best. And then I get to high school and maybe I'm, you know, the fifth best. And so I begin to perhaps view myself as not being as worthy as other things. Um, 
the nice thing though is that they will begin to adjust to their pecking order and then once they adjust to this new pecking order their self-esteem will begin to stabilize um, the other thing is is that we know that self-worth which is a type of self-esteem quite often is also viewed based on their ethnicity meaning is is that if they have something in which society looks down on them then they may see themselves perhaps a little less than others but if they happen to have an ethnicity where people tend to look up at them um, or see them as norm that may help so i have a friend who's buddhist and her children were raised as Buddhists. And she often talks about the difficulty her children have had being Buddhists because the Buddhists really only have one holiday, which is Buddha Day. And when her children went to take that day off to uh, celebrate Buddha Day, um, it was kind of interesting in that they had to take a day of absence. They didn't get a, a buy, you might want to say, like you do in religious holidays. And when their children didn't seem to want to participate in a lot of these holidays because they viewed them as religious holidays, they quite often were sort of looked down on, especially during the Christmas times because they didn't have Kwanzaa, they didn't have Passover, and they didn't celebrate Christmas. It's not their holiday. And so when they were asked, um, I think it was around fifth grade, to write a letter to Santa Claus because that was part of the assignment and it was supposed to be for charity because if you send in all these letters and they said, no, we won't write one to Santa Claus because we don't believe in Santa Claus and I'm not going to write one to St. Nick because that's not a belief we had. You know, the other children sort of made fun of them and they made fun of them because it wasn't within their religious belief. And the fact that they don't really celebrate Christmas um, has gotten them to, you know, kind of have to hide, you want to say, almost during those holidays. So because they happen to be on a religion that is not popular here in the United States, um, that has contributed to some of their self-worth, you might want to say. As far as their self-worth, there are many things we can do to help these individuals improve their self-worth. One of the things is, is that you have to understand what your teen is saying about themselves now there are people who are optimists and there are people who are pessimists that is true but just because someone has an optimistic viewpoint doesn't always mean that they really see themselves as worthy as somebody else because worthiness is judging yourself against somebody else or against some expectation you have in society so Somebody may be an optimistic talker, but when you really get to listening to them, you realize that they aren't as achieving as you think. And then there are pessimists, that is true, and pessimists will say things that, you know, oh, I don't think this will happen, but you look at their grades and you look at their achievements and they really are pushing themselves and they really do see themselves as having worth, you might want to say, they're just pushing themselves. So for us in society, it becomes a little bit difficult um, we have to understand how they view things and how they see things and not tell them that they're wrong, but to help them explore a different viewpoint if their self-esteem is low, especially if they're comparing themselves to people who they may never be able to reach. I always rec um, remembered Selena Gomez and, and kind of applaud her. At one point, her picture was taken for a cover of like a teen magazine. And they thinned her thighs in this picture. And she was pissed, basically. And she put out there, if her thighs weren't thin enough, then whose thighs would ever be thin enough for the cover of this magazine? Because she was very thin and in a very healthy weight. And she put these original pictures of what she originally looked like versus what they made her look like so that young women would know that even she couldn't meet the expectations of beauty that this magazine had for the cover and that if she, her body wasn't good enough then nobody's body was going to be good enough for this magazine and the magazine had basically an image that was unattainable um, there has been big lack backlashes at makeup companies because they will take these beauty shots of models with the makeup but what people don't realize is that those beauty shots have been touched up so if the model had acne, they took away the acne. So you would think that if I wore this makeup, maybe it would hide my acne, but it didn't. Um, lashes were extended if they were advertising mascara. So they'd either wear false lashes and then put some 
mascara on the false lash or they may even artificially extend those so there's been a lot of backlash also that you're advertising products and using images that are physically impossible to achieve and yet a young person who may be 14 or 15 and who's just exploring their looks and how they should look is trying to emulate something that even adults even the most what we might consider top looks can't achieve so how can they possibly achieve it when it's not even a real look? Now, I like this section. It says the myth of storm and stress. Um, as you read very quickly, most teens get along with their parents. They say they have a loving, appreciative um, relationship with their parents. 25% uh, of teens say they've had some major argument with their parent that may have upset them. But 75% or more said, you know, I, I look to them for their values. I do talk to them about things. So why do we have this belief then that teens fight their parents? Well, two things. Television, because let's face it, it's a lot more fun to watch a drama with a team slamming a door and walking out on a parent than to watch them getting along and being all lovey-dovey. But the other thing is, is that we tend to notice the unusual. So if you are somebody who gets along and you see a um, teen and a, and a parent get along, what you don't notice is that getting along. What you do notice is when the fight happens, because that is emotional, that is drama. But if we were to look at how often a fight might occur versus how often they actually get along, you would find the fighting is a very small amount. And quite often the fights are more about the teen probably exploring some sort of aspect of individuality about themselves, wanting to stay out later or do something that uh, perhaps parents don't think that the teen is ready for. It's not really about a disapproval of their parents or not loving their parents. But remember, we said moodiness was not about hormones. Moodiness was about the change in activities, the change in responsibilities. And that may bring up a little bit more storm than anything else. We mostly skip a lot of the romance stuff and the career stuff. I do bring in Holland, though, for just a moment. Holland is about careers, and the only reason I bring in Holland is that it is a test that you can take out online. And what Holland said is that if we really look at personalities, that they're sort of broken up into six personality types when it comes to careers. And he said that no one career will have basically all the aspects of that single aspect. But if we were to take these different um, personality types and we look at number one, number two, and number three, that when you combine them, you're going to be able to find people who um, find jobs that sort of fit into their nature. So with teens, what we'd like them to do is to basically take a look at these personality types and say, you know, which one tends to be the most dramatic when it comes to work? Are you need a social aspect of your life? Do you need the artistic aspect of your life? Do you need the realistic aspect of your of your life and whichever one of these tends to be the strongest for you then that should help you begin to focus on work that you might find helps you fulfill that aspect of your personality and the jobs that teens take at their young time also allows them to begin to explore what the life of work is and also explore which aspects of jobs that they like so you know do we like sort of in this first picture kind of the mechanical aspect of life. You can see this is very absolute. Whereas this uh, second one, this gentleman is a little bit more on the enterprising kind of one. And then down here in the last one, we've got the social lady who really needs to be social. And so she's like a counselor at a teen camp or at a camp. T summer jobs are really great way for teens to explore these different aspects and begin to eliminate potential jobs that or career fields that don't allow them to explore all aspects of what they might need to find a job that's not only well paying but fulfilling but we also have to look at jobs as far as what does that job do for the teen and while we know that most freshmen and most seniors have jobs we also have to be careful about the amount of hours they work so once we basically hit those 15 hours of work each week 
we really see that it tends to downplay the success of people in both high school and college level. Now, it doesn't mean a college student shouldn't have a job, but if we have to work, we might want to reduce the amount of college we take at a time. And as adult learners, you probably are very well aware that jobs will become very stressful and go ahead and find that job and family will come over perhaps schoolwork. And that's what we really don't want for high schoolers. The amount of high schoolers that work have dramatically increased in the last 20 years. Um, Back in the 80s and 90s, high schoolers were lucky to work on a Saturday. Now high schoolers on average will work two days during the week and on the weekend. So it's really directly affecting the educational levels. I also want to point out the second bullet. We tend to think that, oh, let a high schooler work, they'll learn a lot about money, but they actually don't. And one of the things as a consumer psychologist is that we really target high schoolers with money because high schoolers have the most disposable income at any time in their life. That's because, as they say here, most of the basic things are covered that is financial by their parents or their living situations. So they don't really have to pay for much, which means that all the money that they pretty much make gets to be used on fun. So where you and I as adult and having households to run may think twice about buying a thousand dollar phone. They don't think twice about buying a thousand dollar phone because they look down and they say, well, I'm making, you know, $200 a week and in a month I'll have that thousand dollars. They're not thinking I have to pay an electric bill. I have to pay a rent bill. I have to pay this bill. Maybe I need to get some gas, but that's about it. So they actually have a lot of disposable income, which allows them a lot of freedom to buy what they want when they want, because it is their money. And so quite often they will simply make that decision. It's my money. I can do what you want. Um, I highly recommend that people look at some of the investment writers on how to teach uh, money management to teens. Um, a lot of them will say, you know, you need to go ahead and have a teen set up a savings account where half that money goes into a savings account and that money will be set aside for college or that money will be set aside for a car later on. Um, most banks will help you set up an account in which a teen cannot access the money put in there unless they have your signature until they're 18 years of age. And then at 18, they can access the money. But in the meanwhile, you're teaching them how to save or maybe use that money for when they need that money. So when they get that speeding ticket and it has to be paid off they've saved some money to be able to pay that but they also don't get all the money they get half each paycheck to be able to use as they wish and the other half begins to get saved we do find little things like that really make a huge difference in teaching teens more about money and money management this brings us to our last subject in this book and that's depression um I think most of you know what depression is, but we do want to make sure you understand the difference between basically the blues, you might want to say, and depression. The blues are short term. In fact, you should feel blue at some point. Most people will. If I went out and played this big basketball game and I was in the tournament final and I didn't win, I should feel bad. I should have yeah, you know, the blues basically for a little while it may last a couple of days, but then I sort of come out of it. Whereas depression is constant and long lasting. And there's a deep sort of hole that these people will feel. Whereas when I'm blue, I'm sad, but it's depression is more than sadness. It is far more common in girls, we know, than in boys, but don't think it doesn't occur in boys. Um, what's going to be kind of sad is that when we start talking about depression is what is the outcome of depression? As far as the risk factors for depression, some of the biggest things that we really want to look at is sort of poor emotional regulation. And one reason why girls may be a little bit more uh, sustainable or susceptible to depression is because of the development of the difference of the brain between girls and boys. And really what we're talking about is the serotonin level, 
which is our happy drug, and the neofemperin. Um, basically, if the serotonin, if you don't have enough of it, which is a happy drug, then you may become a little bit more depressed. We also have to look at things like poverty, extreme negative self-beliefs. So all of these things combined can really drive people into depression. By the way, it's not just simply teens, but since we're talking about adolescents at this point, this can also occur to people as they move out of their houses, which is, again, remember, adolescents are up until 20. So sometimes people are perfectly fine while they're living in their houses. But the moment they live out of their houses, they begin to have problems, too, because maybe they were sort of on the edge of it. They didn't quite push over to depression but once they get out and they find they can't handle the world on their own maybe they thought they could and it's just not working the way they thought then we also can find um, depression sort of rear its ugly head because we have depression as something that happens uh, more often than we like although we do say it's only about 10 percent of youth we also have suicide the interesting thing is that before 15 years of age, suicide is pretty rare. Um, it doesn't mean that it doesn't happen, but only one out of 10,000 kids will even attempt it. And even then, we don't see many 15-year-olds actually being successful. We've already talked about how Native Americans have the highest rate of suicide. But another unfortunate fact is, is that boys will be most likely to be successful at committing suicide. Now, the reason that boys are more successful is the method of suicide that basically girls and boys choose. Girls will tend to pick pills, um, slitting their wrists, something that may take a slightly longer time to actually occur. And if you don't do it exactly right, will not result in suicide. Now, when the girls take a lot of pills, it doesn't mean that they're always crying out for help. They want to commit suicide, but they don't have the right number of pills or they don't have the right type of pills. They just take everything they've got in the cabinet and it may hurt them. We see a lot of them having unfortunate brain injuries from it, but quite often they can also perhaps have their stomachs pumped or um, recover from, from the toxins that were given to them. Whereas boys use guns and guns are hard to come back from. When you shoot your brains, we cannot put them back together. So what happens is that for boys, they tend to use um, harder, more strict methods, you might wanna say. They're gonna be more likely to use guns, to hang themselves, to jump off things. Where the girls will tend to do the slit the wrists, take the pills um, of something of that nature. So when we're talking about suicide there are some signs that we always want to look at and of course threats of suicide should never be put aside and again for most of us if somebody came up to you and they're teen they're saying oh god i'm just thinking about dying i just i'm going to kill myself of course you're going to take that seriously we have to also make sure that it's not just being sarcastic but some of the ones that we may not look at very much or we may not see, but we have to be careful about, especially this third one, giving away valued possessions. There is a difference between giving away my childhood toys because I've sort of grown up and grown out of them. And so I want to pass them on to the next generation versus giving away things that are precious to me. And the reason that a teen who is about to commit suicide quite often will give away valued possessions by the way it's not just teens even adults will do this is that they've come to the decision now that they are going to do this but they want to make sure these special things get to the right people especially people who um younger people who may not be thinking about wills or things like this they have a necklace that they love and that necklace they really want to make sure their girlfriend gets that necklace that the girlfriend always remembers who they were um they may have a poster or a song or uh, unfortunately in my days it was records and i know today it's not but they have something that's important to them and they'll give these away to make sure that these items are taken care of afterwards the other interesting thing is that quite often once they've made the decision to commit suicide and they're preparing for it and adolescents prepare for suicide they don't tend to just do it at a whim they tend to prepare for suicide is that they get calm and quite often they're happy and they seem to have picked up their mood why because they've 
in their head have now made the decision that this is going to end this this horrible feeling that I have, this emptiness, this this overwhelming bleakness is that it's going to end. And that brings sort of a relief to them. And it brings a relief while they make this plan to do this. And so you can see sort of this change suddenly from somebody who just seemed very withdrawn and sad to being sort of okay. And that's where you worry about things like they quit their job and bring back all their clothes to the job and they start giving things away. These are signs that someone is preparing to say goodbye. Beyond the antidepressants, there has to be therapy because most adolescents who are depressed quite often have a negative viewpoint of themselves or see low self-worth. And so talk therapy tends to be there to help um, interact and help the teens basically pull this out of them. But we do know that if it is left uh, unchecked, we're going to see adult depression. We're going to see poor relationships. We can also see much more drug use and other abuses. And when I say other abuses, understand we tend to think drugs and alcohol, but we can also see teens who become anorexic. We can see teens who become gamblers. We can see adolescents who withdraw from society and fall into their video games and sort of leave the world in a way. We see all kinds of behavior patterns that may occur that helps take them out of that sort of absolute depressed feeling that they have. Most schools do have prevention programs. Um, if you feel that you know anybody who might be depressed, of course, we ask that you step in and make notification to their parents, um, make notification perhaps to the authorities if you feel that they are on the edge of suicide, but they should not be left untreated. So the final thing in this book is kind of delinquency. Now delinquency is an interesting word because one of the questions comes is who gets to decide what is delinquent? Who gets to decide what behavior is a delinquent behavior? And the answer is you do. Delinquency tends to be assigned based on your personal viewpoints of how things should or shouldn't work. But with adolescents, we do know there are two types of delinquency that tends to happen. And one is the adolescent limited antisocial behavior. And basically these are behavior patterns where adolescents are pushing sort of to the edge to see what would happen. Um, they generally disappear, but this may be the young lady who really wanted that pair of earrings and she doesn't have the earrings and her friends are like, well, just kind of swipe the earrings, just take them. And so she does a quick five finger discount. She may never steal anything else again. In fact, she gets out of the score store score. <laughs> she gets out of the store and you know, she might be giggling at first and in a little while she feels really bad about it. Um, but they're not really, lifelong it happens for a little bit and they're minor crimes as we like to say where the ones you have to worry about is the life course persistent antisocial behavior so this is a person who tends to emerge very early in youth with antisocial behavior it could be a cultural thing meaning is that they're being raised in a household or in a community in which those type of behaviors are acceptable or even desired we often see in um, families that tend to, um, how do I put this, participate in criminal activity, that they quite often engage their children early on in criminal activity. You may have seen YouTube videos where uh, a person sends their kid in to distract a store clerk and the adult goes and steals something. Well, when that's the activity that I'm being taught to do, then I'm going to perhaps grow up and do those same activities because that's the culture. But we also then have some people who simply have antisocial behaviors. Parents sometimes don't see it. They don't see it because at first it may be unreasonable to think the child is really doing this at three and four and five. Um, also, the parents may not have antisocial behavior, so they may not see it as something really happening. So I always talk about this young friend, a friend of mine who had a young child. And at five years of age, 
we had gone to Cracker Barrel to eat. And after going to Cracker Barrel, we went to the beach. Now, I happened to be watching him just because he was behaving a little odd to me when we got to the beach. He was making sort of this hole and then he kind of put something in the hole and buried it. And I thought, oh, he's, you know, probably swiped some sort of food from that he was supposed to have, a bag of chips or something, and he was sort of burying the evidence of the bag. And I just kind of waited back because I thought, ah, you know, before we leave, I'll make sure he digs up that bag and throws it away so some turtle or something doesn't try to eat it. But as we're sitting there, all of a sudden, he's sort of getting his parents' attention. And he says, oh, I think I'll go make a sandcastle over here. Uh, Mom, you want to help me make a sandcastle over here? And Mom goes off to help him make a sandcastle. And I'm looking, going, that's exactly where he just buried something. And sure enough, what does he uncover but... <gasps> A harmonica. How lucky is this child that right where he picked to build a sandcastle, he found a harmonica. Interestingly, it was still in its wrapper. By the way, harmonicas are sold at Cracker Barrel. And very quickly, I realized what had occurred. This little child had stolen the harmonica because harmonicas were down sort of as level. And while we were paying, nobody was watching him because nobody thought that a five-year-old would swipe a harmonica. And he'd already figured out how he was going to mysteriously have this harmonica by mysteriously finding it. So even by five years of age, he was already thinking about this and how he could do this. And as he got older, you know, he did other little things. And so I had to point out one time that the candy that he had, he had stolen from CVS because the candy was right there. And while parents are paying money and he was swiping candy bars. So he could see basically opportunities for theft, you might want to say. And so one day we're at a restaurant and I'm looking over at him and I say, you know, I could so easily just walk over and take that tip. And he looks at me and he goes, yeah, that wouldn't be very notice, would it? I said, no, nope, not at all. I said, they left a pretty good tip. He said, yeah, and I noticed over there there was some tip money left. And I said, yeah, and did you notice over there? And we just started having this long conversation about all the stuff you could steal and how easily it would be to steal. And I think his poor parents were going to fall under the table. See, they never even thought about it. They never even saw it. But this kid could see it. And having this long conversation about all the different things he sold, you could steal and how you could steal it and how you could walk out with things, which means that we identified very early that he had sort of this antisocial behavior, you might want to say, sort of naturally in him. You're not going to be able to take that away from him. You can teach him right and wrong, but he sees it. So I can't say that I'm an expert at this. I would definitely bring him to a therapist and make sure that you have some good moral development. But at the same point, if the child sees it, how can we use that talent to help him do something with it that would be successful in school? So we started watching things like CSI shows. Um, he started, the parents started getting him with crime dramas and things like this. And sure enough, he would be happy to try to catch the criminals because if he could think like a criminal, then he could catch the criminals. And he is now studying to want to be an FBI agent. So, you know, it can just be there and we don't even realize it because the other person or the family is not that way. But if it's not found, not shaped, then yeah, we're going to have this child who's going to grow up and unless something has stepped in to help them, um, especially when they're in adolescence, this behavior pattern could get them into falling into antisocial behavior patterns that could wind up hurting them for the rest of their lives. So that's the end of this lecture. I will be seeing you shortly, I hope. Uh, make sure that you do the extra credit. And as always, if you have any questions, just email me down there and I will respond as quickly as possible.